here and I'm going to be going over the big 14 game main slate we have here on Tuesday August 1 we are down to it um, last two months of the season give or take um, and big 14 game slate so let's just get into it we got a bunch to talk about as usual and I talk a lot as usual so uh, we have projections and ownership loaded it's a strider day it's a framber day uh, both of those guys insanely expensive. Um, and 14 games, we could certainly pivot. We got Lance Lynn making his debut down here for the Dodgers. He gets Oakland tonight. Uh, seeing a lot of ownership naturally. But, um, you know, perhaps maybe a, a little bit aggressive or a good leverage spot at the very least. If you want to play some Oakland. Um, and some other kind of obvious spots that might not be the best, at least for me, we'll talk about those. So keep an eye out all throughout the day for projections and ownership. Um, housekeeping note, like today's the trade deadline, right? So you got to be aware, if you're playing a bunch of teams, certainly, that today some guys could get moved. Um, and, you know, you like going into lock... Uh, since we've got such a large slate, um, you know, starting at a, you know, natural 7 Eastern, um, you know, we shouldn't have too many issues. We, I, I believe the, uh, the deadline is at, uh, 3 Eastern, uh, somewhere. It could be 4 or 5, something like that. Uh, so everybody should have, you know, their roster solidified or whatever, but we might get some late lineups, um, while teams are still making moves or doing, you know, whatever the hell they're doing. Um, so keep that in mind. And also, guys may be in the DK player pool. And same thing with FanDuel. Um, they may be in the player pool, but get traded and not accrue points. So keep an eye out for what happens today. Uh, it should be mostly cleared up by tomorrow. Um, but, you know, something to be aware of, certainly if you're playing a lot of teams today. Okay, so let's just get into it um, and start with Tampa and New York. In Yankee Stadium, we got Zach Eflin, Eflin on the mound. 10 uh, 3 for him. Carlos Rodon on the other side. Decent pitching matchup here. Eflin's been pretty good this season. He's been pretty consistent, I would say. Um, I think he's a little bit overpriced here for this particular matchup. Now, he induces a lot of ground balls. That's what I do like about Eflin. What I don't like is still a little bit of the fishy hard contact. Um, Suppression's been great, though. Three and a half ERA with the XFIP, actually. Yeah, and the XERA. Sierra as well, pointing a little bit south. Um, strain rate is at a pretty low 70%, to be quite honest. You could see a little bit of positive run suppression uh, regression for him. It doesn't walk anybody. The control's been excellent, and he's staying really off of the barrel. So, uh, for the most part, Eflin's been pretty good. He's got five and, you know, even six pitches, call it, uh, that he's going to work with here. Hopefully, he's not throwing this slider pretty much at all, um, giving up, yeah, you know, in that short sample, 15 outs to the field. That's um, not good. But uh, overall, really good fastball mix here. Pretty balanced uh, for the most part between the, the two-seamer and the cutter. Doesn't really use a lot of the four-seamer. Wish he'd throw it more um, and get a little bit more balance there. The one sort of knock on Eflin is that he doesn't have a true swing and miss pitch, really, against the left side of the plate. I know he's got the curveball. He doesn't do, induce good whiffs here with this uh, against lefties. Um, but we'd like to see more value out of a changeup, right? And that would make him really, really equitable. Uh, overall, 25% K rate this year and no walks with a lot of ground balls. So sign me up um, in general. However, we got some fly ball hitters over here from the Yankees, notably uh, a Judge and Jake Bowers types. Uh, Glaber's neutral ground ball to fly ball. Um, Harrison Bader a little bit, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is kind of a, a sneaky dangerous matchup and the price tag for Eflin you know it's up above 10,000 we're not we're not getting him at you know low 9ks or anything um, like we were earlier in the season and above 10,000 this year yeah he's, he's popped for a couple times you know for a, a 30 point outing twice um, and he's popped for north of 25 one other time and in there twice excuse me and everything 
um, outside of those four outings has been, you know, in the 20 to 22 range. And at, at 10,000, I think we're, you know, that's leaving it uh, a bit on the table for us. So um, he could be a little bit fishy expensive in this particular spot. I really like 3% ownership, of course. And you can still go after the Yankees because even with Judge back, they're still going to strike out. So um, I'm okay playing a little bit of Eflin here. I don't want to get too crazy. Maybe 10% of your teams I think is, is fine, depending on how you structure your builds elsewhere. Um but I obviously we have to have exposure to Judge on the other side every single day, um, and you could play some short stacks here. I think uh, I don't really want any Anthony Rizzo. He's just been terrible this season. Um, yeah, but he's a fly ball hitter, right? And he'll be able to lift the baseball. Um, you know, Eflin's not going to walk him a lot necessarily, even though his walk rate's only about eight nine percent this season. Generally he's still a pretty patient hitter. Um so you play like a short judge Rizzo Jake Bowers type of three man or something. If you want to throw in a full five man with Glaber and Stanton, yeah, that's okay. Go ahead. Um I think I'd probably just have to side with Eflin, but I'm lukewarm for the most part on on everything here. I generally don't like I think a lot of the upside is priced in for Eflin up here above 10,000. So it'd be like a judge, Jake Bowers, um, little, maybe a two man or even just kind of one off pieces there from the Yankees. On the other side, the Yanks have uh, Carlos Rodon going and I don't really trust him, man. He's been walking a crap load of people here. Um, so I want to see this tick down. I think he's overpriced for how many walks he's given up so far. Uh, it's been pretty fishy. He was good in his last outing. Um, you know, results-wise, but he still walked three guys against the Mets, walked five against the Angels, walked two and gave up four runs at Coors, and walked two and gave up a couple against the Cubs in his first start back. So um, I'm still kind of in wait-and-see mode here with Rodon. Now, Tampa's going to strike out a little bit, right, at a 23% clip um, against lefties this season, but still a 120 WRC+. plus. They haven't seen a lot of lefties really – compared to the rest of the league, I guess. Just 750 PAs, so this deep into the season, it's kind of, you know, fishy low, to be honest. But they still hit for a lot of power. They're very opportunistic over here. Uh, we're finally seeing their price tags on on Yandi and Wander Franco, Randy Rosarena in particular, tick down a little bit. Um, so that's finally, you know, nice to see. Wander at 55 is you know, slightly more playable than the 57, 59 he's been for basically the entire season. Harold Ramirez, I like this a good bit at 3,000. You play Isaac Paredes at 37 or one of the cheap outfielders like a Manny Margot. Jose Siri, I think this is a pretty decent spot for him as well. Christian Bethencourt's always hit lefties pretty good. Um, and, of course, you've got Yandi and, and Wander and Randy up at the top, as I mentioned. So I think Tampa is an intriguing stack here. Um, Carlos Rodon only going to see about 10% ownership. This kind of makes sense if you want to take shots with a little Rodon. I'd, frankly, I think he's overpriced for the matchup. So I'm probably going to stay off of it. I don't like the walk so far. He's got to get this under control, so to speak, um, You know, before I get too thrilled about playing him against one of the best offenses in baseball. So uh, I'm going to leave him on the shelf for the most part. I'll get to a little bit of Eflin and some correlated Rays teams, I think. Um, I'd like to you know, try and get there if I can. And maybe just a, a piece here or there from the Yankees. Okay, Milwaukee and Washington. Freddie Peralta, same sort of deal. I think he's a little bit overpriced. He's got uh, at 9,400 here. He's got a 9% walk rate, 9% barrel rate, right? He's been really up and down this season. Um, now, obviously in his last outing, he just kind of went off. Went six innings, struck out 13. Um well, I'm not going to be chasing that, I'll tell you that much. Uh, certainly against Washington, that is an incredibly uh, low-probability outlier performance against Washington. They they did trade Jamer, um, so he's gone. And that really takes the, the highest upside bat for them out of the lineup. Um, however, they're still not going to strike out a lot, these guys over here. Like Kabert in particular, Lane Thomas, Joey Manessis, not really not going to strike out these guys. Um, T.J. Abrams, Dom Smith. So do I want to play Freddie? Yeah, maybe a little bit. I mean, certainly at 7% ownership. I think the price tag is okay given that ownership figure so far. 
Um, but that said, the strikeout matchup, it, it's certainly a, a down matchup, even though they did, you know, get rid of Jamer here. Um, only a 19% strikeout rate in aggregate over 2,700 PAs this season. Like, yeah, you know, just Jam losing Jamer, not going to change that all that much. Um, so yeah, you could play him. I think, I think this is okay. Playing some Freddie. Uh, I don't want to get too crazy with it because of the strikeout matchup, but you still need upside on a 14-game slate. He certainly has upside, but once again, like just how I play, I don't like chasing career type of strikeout outings uh, and performances uh, with pitchers. I think there's just a, a natural regression back to the mean, and Freddie Peralta is not a um, you know a 40% strikeout, 50% strikeout type of guy anymore, even though this season. It's still very high. He's much better strikeout stuff, or with the strikeout stuff against the right side, 32%. So we generally like to favor right-handed heavy teams. Um, you know, when we're playing a lot of Freddy and Washington's still going to platoon a good bit here. They'll have probably, you know, six, maybe even seven lefties in the lineup that don't strike out. So, um, you know, a little fishy here. He's given up a lot of power, man, in aggregate, roughly a 200 ISO this season. Even though the X ISO is sitting down here at, uh, you know, 160, um, you know, that's not a necessarily a small number. So he'll give up some pop and, and give up some homers, give up some balls in the air here. I think it's a little bit too much in general. We're not worried about it, of course, with Washington too terribly. But, um, you know, that's what takes me off of Freddie a lot of the time. And... The 9,400 price tag is a bit high for him. So uh, the matchup is okay from a suppression standpoint, and he still does have, you know, he's good enough to blast through the Nationals. Um, so I think it's fine playing him at low ownership, but if this ownership steams, I'd probably come off of it. And Like, I don't want to get, you know, a full 2x the field or anything necessarily. Um, you know, maybe 10% uh, of my teams or something is probably where I'll land with that. I would guess uh, Jojo Gray uh, going for the national 6,500 for him. Now, he was serviceable in his last start. Uh, what against the Cubs? I believe. Um, no, it was against the Mets. Uh, went six innings, right? Didn't strike out anybody walking some guys, you know, the, the walks over the last, what, seven starts, uh, six starts, I suppose. have been a little bit fishy, right? Walks. He's walked four twice. He, and in each of his last two outings, he's walked three. Um, so the walk starting to creep back up there again when they were better earlier in the season, but still a 10 and a half percent walker. It's mostly to the lefties at 14% here. Um, I want to be careful with this, man. I, like I do generally like the price tag for Jojo, but with just a, a below a slightly below average fastball mix and slightly above average breaking arsenal, um, you know, he's a back end kind of serviceable innings eater type of starter anymore. The strikeout stuff is gone now that he's suppressing power and inducing soft contact. That's all good, and in good matchups, I think he can survive. Uh, we talked to, about him a little bit at 6,600 in his last start against the Mets and how he could be serviceable. I think this is a, a similar type of matchup. He could be serviceable, but we're certainly going to worry about upside. Um I like going after the Brewers generally, pretty much with anybody, right? Uh, Yelich, I don't want to play 5,600 in this particular matchup. Carlos Santana, I think, could be okay, 3,800, but he's a sole first base play, not my favorite there. So I'm not jacked about these price tags. Willie Adamas, 49. Willie Contreras at 51. Uh, even South Freelich in the four is at, at 3,900 now. Um, so it's not my favorite going after JoJo. It's mostly just kind of a write-off for me. Uh, I don't like... Washington's offense don't like Milwaukee's offense don't really want to play Jojo necessarily but don't really want to play a lot of Freddie Peralta uh, necessarily either because of the matchup so um kind of a a write-off here for me uh most exposure is certainly just going to come with some Freddie I believe okay let's move on Detroit and Pittsburgh um Matt Manning 6900 think he's a bit overpriced here I like the the Pirates here uh to be quite honest, you only got to lay about a dollar twenty-five in the betting market. I think this is a pretty decent play. Um, Manning, since he has uh, come back healthy, um, you know he's having some problems here in short samples. Yeah, with some lefties, walk rate's good, barrel rate 
fishy high here at a, at a full 10%. Fly ball pitcher, right, with the four-seamer slider mix. Four-seamer has really been, uh, he's been struggling with it. Inducing whiffs and inducing ground balls um, with the curveball slider combination down in the strike zone, but with the four-seamer, that's elevating everything fastball-wise, and he's still throwing it a full 50% of the time, so it's a little fishy there. Doesn't have a pure swing and miss pitch uh, against the left side of the plate, right with the changeup, and that's why we only see a 15% strikeout rate there so far. Uh, again, we have a short sample, um, so these numbers will normalize a little bit, but they're not going to normalize a hell of a lot higher. He's efficient early in the count, which could keep him serviceable, but I, I think I want to play some of the Pirates here. I think they're very much in play in deeper tournament stuff. Jack Sawinski, 3,500, like this play a lot. Brian Reynolds down to 4,300 again. Uh, now we're talking. He's not up at 5,000 or anything. This is far, far more playable. Uh, Jimin Choi at 26. He's got excellent numbers over his entire career against right-handers. Um, sole first base play, but he's 2,600. You can kind of eat that a little bit. So if you want to throw in a McCutcheon or a Henry Davis or even an Andy Rodriguez behind the plate, they're all very, very cheap here. Uh, Brian Reynolds the most expensive, 4,300. And this can get you to, like, Strider teams, for example, who we'll get to uh, in a little bit. So I like the Pirates here going after some Matt Manning. He's got some pretty dreadful numbers. 278 ISO allowed to the lefties so far this year with neutral ground balls per fly ball and 44% hard contact here. Um, so it probably, you know, favorites-wise, it'd be like short stacks, Sawinski, Jimin Choi, Endy, uh, or even a Brian Reynolds. I, but I do think full stacks, given their pricing, um, it's going to fully put them in play, even though the ballpark is bad right here in PNC. Warm a little bit, you know, it's 80 degrees, just kind of whatever. Uh, it's a little more hitter friendly to left handers than it is to righties. So, uh, I want to get to some lefties here if I can, uh, Yohan Oviedo on the mound for the Pirates, 6,200. The price tag is going to put him in play against Detroit, right? Um, but we're worried generally about upside for Oviedo. His slider and curveball stuff is, is pretty good. It's the fastball and changeup mix that really leaves it kind of hanging for him. Um, you know, we talked about this pretty much every start with Oviedo this season. The, the breaking stuff always keeps him in play, and that can get him some swing and miss. Um, you know, but the slider being just break even here, he's, he's not inducing any swing and miss to the right hander. It's just 16%. It's much better than the lefties. That's the curveball going to work. Um, Power-wise, he's struggling with the four-seamer, getting right onto the barrel. Got a little bit of fishy walks right to the left side at, at a full 11%. But overall, he induces some ground balls at a buck 35 per um, per fly ball, and that makes him serviceable. So it's 6,200 against a pretty bad offense. There's a little bit of strikeout upside for Oviedo here because Detroit's still striking out a tick above average, tick, tick and a half or so above average, 82 WRC plus in a big ballpark, uh, 132 ISO and 32% hard. So they're going to hit some ground balls here too. And I think playing a little bit of Oviedo is probably pretty warranted. So the ownership here makes sense for me. Um, in general, obviously concerned with upside, but that, some of that is priced in here at, at 6200 So I think he's playable, and some correlated teams are playable as well. If you want to run like a Strider, Pittsburgh with a Yohan Oviedo, that's probably a, a pretty intriguing build. Um, and you might even be able to squeeze in a more expensive secondary stack with that as well. I haven't tried to build it just yet, but I, you know, look at it, these price tags, you might be able to make that happen. So, um, mostly Pittsburgh here. And like I said, laying a dollar 25 into betting markets, I think is a pretty decent play here. Uh, okay, let's move on. Baltimore, Toronto, Kyle Bradish going for Baltimore and hundred Hun young Jin Ryu. Easy for me to say, uh, is making his debut this season coming off of TJ, uh, Bradish at 8,700. I think the price tag is a little fishy for him in this matchup. Now, overall he induces ground balls and he's got, you know, average strikeout stuff, slightly below average. He doesn't walk guys, and he stays off of the barrel, um, and he doesn't give up hard, hard contact. So for the most part, with a five-pitch mix, 8700 is an okay price tag. But the matchup here is terrible, right? Um, so I don't really want to be playing him at this price. I think a lot of the upside is, is really... Uh, priced in for us here. So um, not a ton of value that we can go after 
here, you know, t- targeting Toronto. Uh, still a difficult offense. You know, I think Toronto it might be trying to make some moves here. So we have to keep an eye on, um, you know, what they might do with their lineup. They may end up selling because Bo Bichette got hurt yesterday. And that's basically going to tank their uh, their hopes at making the playoffs um, if he's out for a significant period. So you got to keep an eye on that. Maybe we've got news. That's going to really determine what they do here uh, with the, at the trade deadline. Um, they may end up unloading a guy like a Brandon Belt. And, it, I mean, who knows what they're going to do. But uh, Toronto is certainly one of the teams you got to pay attention to. In general, if everybody is healthy outside of Bo Bichette, even still, I don't want to be playing Kyle Bradish because you still got to get through Springer. Witt, who doesn't strike out a hell of a lot. You got to get through Vladdy and Matt Chapman. Um, you know, there's still a, a very dangerous offense against right handed pitching. And Bradish not going to be able to throw it by them. And that's really how you have to be able to do attack Toronto. So, uh, do I want to stack Toronto? Not necessarily, because I kind of respect Bradish's arsenal a little bit. And I really like the fact that he doesn't give up a lot of hard contact and induces ground balls. So I don't really want to play Toronto at their normal price tags necessarily. Um, lefties or righties, really. I, I'm not super thrilled with uh, with going after these guys. So kind of a write-off um, from that angle with Bradish and Toronto. And Ryu going for the Jays. As I mentioned, he's coming off TJ. I'm playing the wait-and-see game. And this is kind of a bad matchup anyway. Uh, so I don't really want to be playing a bunch of left-handers against Baltimore. 109 WRC plus with a 10% walk rate. That's mostly coming from Rutch. But just a 22% strikeout rate. Hit for a little bit of average here at 250, give or take. With some sneaky pop, 170. Um, they got some guys over here for the right side of the plate that hit left-handers very well. Notably Austin Hayes, Ryan Mountcastle. Rutch obviously hits from the right side. And Santander, too. Um, down at the bottom of the lineup, they've got James McCann, Georgie Mateo, Ryan McKenna, Ramon Urias, and even a Jordan Westbrook, or, uh, Westberg. rather. Um, so they can go literally nine righties in the lineup tonight. And generally, Ryu is a, a pretty neutral split kind of guy. Uh, don't have any of the numbers in here. He's been out for a year and a half, of course. Um, but... He's also a neutral kind of ground ball to fly ball sort of guy. So uh, I'm going to play the wait and see game with Rio. I do like the price tag for him. If he were at seven, this is a $9,500 arm generally uh, when he's healthy. But we've seen a lot of guys come off of TJ, notably like a Verlander, for example. And a lot of the previous strikeout upside um, and Arsenal type of upside gets really flipped on its head after you come off a of TJ. you got to change a lot of things when you've been off the mound for a year and a half. So um, I'm on the, the wait-and-see train here with uh, with Ryu, and I don't want to be going after Baltimore anyway. So it's mostly, um, if you want to play some, some Baltimore pieces, I think this is okay. Like I said, Austin Hayes and Ryan Mountcastle, these guys are very cheap. Mountcastle's struggling a little bit this season with the injuries. Um you know, but he's still fine. He's 3,600. You could play that. Hayes is 33 leading off. Really good numbers against lefties this year. Uh, Rutch is a bit expensive at 5,000 for him just because he walks so much. Um, Santander is okay, right? Here at 4,200, we like him from the right side. And you can throw in a Jorge Mateo, for example, down at the bottom. He's 2,600 now. He's no longer 5,000. Um, so I think this is an intriguing, really off-the-board Baltimore stack if you want to get there. I don't generally want to go after Ryu. I respect him a lot. Uh, but I think the upside is certainly there for Baltimore to capitalize um, you know, on their really good numbers against lefties in general. So uh, it's an off-the-board stack, low exposure, low probability, I think. Um, but for the most part, you know, still in play as sort of a, a mid-range type, type of stack. Uh, okay, let's move on to the Angels and the Braves. Patty Sandoval and Strider, 7,100 for Sandoval. I just can't do it, man. He just doesn't strike anybody out, and he's a lefty against a very right-handed heavy lineup in Atlanta. Uh, no thank you. Um, I just can't do it. I like Patty, and, you know, I really like the ground balls. Um, I like the hard contact suppression, right? It, he's a He's a pitcher. He's a good arm over here. For DFS, he really leaves it on the table. He's only at a 19% aggregate strikeout this strikeout rate this season, uh, and that makes it really difficult to play. 
power wise, he's only given up a 127 X ISO. That's fantastic, right? With a 320 X Woba, that's pretty good too. Elevated slightly, just because of the you know roughly 10 percent walk rate here. Um, that's not terribly worrisome if you're keeping the ball on the ground this much. And uh, I mean, we do need some strikeouts out of him, um, and then we could like basically completely ignore a 10 percent walk rate with this type of ground ball rate. Um, so we can't totally ignore it because 10% is 10% and you're putting people on base for free, but he still has a 70% or a 69% strand rate here. We could even see some positive regression for Patty, uh, given that he induces so many ground balls when he puts guys on base. Um, the suppression is, you know, the, the, the metrics here uh, are north of four, really because he's letting a lot of these guys come around to score. And we could see some positive regression for him in the strand rate. Um, so that could keep him in play in general, but this is certainly not the matchup, and we're not doing that in Atlanta, even at a nice price tag here at 7100 uh, No, thank you. You can play some of the Braves, as you can play them literally every single day. Uh, Austin Riley, unfortunately, is up to 6100 now, so that's really stiff. Sean Murphy coming off a little bit, down to 55 but he's still 5500 uh, Marcel Asuna has been fantastic over the last, well, really most of the season. Um, you know, back to his like early Cardinals days, when he's hitting hitting the ball over the wall. Uh, guys down at the bottom of the lineup, you'll probably see like a Kevin Pillar in the lineup maybe tonight, something like that. Ozzy Albie's far better from an average standpoint from the right side of the plate, and of course you can always play Acuna. Not my favorite, still at price adjusted. So I'd like to get the short stacks of the Braves here because it's basically impossible to full stack them. Um, if you can make it happen and land on a team you like, then yeah, by all means, go ahead. But generally, I don't want to go after Patty. Um, he's still inducing a lot of ground balls here, and, and that's going to keep him serviceable, even though he'll probably give up three, four runs or whatever. He can still go four or five innings uh, and, and keep Atlanta at bay here a little bit. So that's kind of how I'd like to approach that. Atlanta, sure, but very little Patty. Um, you know, and... and very little Atlanta, I guess, just because they're insanely expensive. Because we want to play Strider, 12-5. Uh, oh boy. Um, you know, CJ Crone is likely going to be in the lineup. He's not in the player pool. It's not like you would like to play him anyway. But he would strike out a good bit here. Um, they're gonna have some righties in here against Strider. Not like we really care what the platoon splits are for Strider. He gives up a little bit more pop to the right-handers. 180 ISO getting onto the barrel a little bit. He is a fly ball pitcher, right, with the four-seamer slider, throwing the change a lot more, so that's good. And he's suppressing uh, what would be, you know, would be contact against left-handers when he's just piping a four-seamer. Um, that's giving him more swing and miss against lefties, so that's really nice. But he also has a 10% barrel rate, so this is nothing. We talked about this with the Shohei Otani a couple of times this season, too, that these guys that are very high strikeout upside guys, um, they still have weaknesses, right? And Strider has gotten taken apart a couple of times this season. So if you want to get to a leverage stack, Strider's still going to be 35, 40% owned in a lot of stuff. Um, you know, play some Otani. Don't, if you're playing a lot of teams, don't uh, neglect Otani here. I don't want to play anybody else. Um, it, it would be maybe, maybe, maybe like a Luis Renjifo who will probably lead off with Taylor Ward uh, on the 60-day DL now. Um, and then possibly like a Hunter Renfro because he's got the lower, the lowest strikeout rate of any, um, you know, quote, power bat in the lineup for them. Mickey Moniak, 5,400. There's just no chance we're playing that. So it'd be Renjifo, Otani, and Hunter Renfro, uh, but you really want to be doing that? I mean, it's just a leverage stack and deep tournament type of stuff. Um, or you could play Otani in probably 20 max. I wouldn't get to it in, in single entry necessarily. Uh, 20 max, I think it's an okay play because Strider's going to be very popular there. So if you can make Strider and some Braves teams happen, go ahead. You're very unlikely to be able to. Um the only thing that's going to keep us off of Strider here, uh, as always, is just the price tag. He's 12-5, and that's very hard to make happen on a full 14-game slate. Okay, let's move on. Minnesota and Seattle, uh, St. Louis, rather. Uh, Pablo Lopez, he's kind of expensive here, 10-8 for this particular matchup. I love Pablo, uh, and we've talked ad nauseum this season. Plate discipline is just fantastic, top to bottom. 
7% walk rate, 71% strike one, 35% chase, 30% CSW, and a 30% K rate. Uh, everything's just excellent. He's got a 415 ERA with, you know, expected metrics pointing well south of that, um, you know, three quarters of a run here or there. 72% strand rate could see that tick up a little bit as well, given how many strikeouts he induces. Um, you know, he could put some guys on base, give up a little bit of batting average right to the left-handers. 250 here with a 150 ISO uh, and some fly balls. So he can strand these guys. You can see some positive regression for Pablo. Um, everything in the arsenal is looks fine with just one break-even pitch in the curveball. That's pretty much okay when you've got four-plus pitches otherwise uh, with the four-seamer, two-seamer slider change. Uh, so he's got a lot of weapons here, and I like him. The price tag, however, in this particular matchup against Cardinals, like I said, is a little fishy here at 10-8. The 7% ownership is certainly going to put him well in play. Uh, he's one of the arms in baseball that has plenty to go after the Cardinals. Um, however, you know, 10 8 10 10-8, and if you want to play strider so there's virtually no chance you're going to be able to get two of these guys up above 10,000 uh, and play an offense that you like maybe it's pittsburgh or something like that or oakland but you really excited about oakland um so if you want to pivot down to pablo i've do, i've got no problems doing this landing on him in, in 20 mag you can even play pablo in single entry he's that good and even though you know some of the upside is priced in here at um at 10-8 in this particular matchup. Cardinals also have to keep an eye on them. They did take Arenado off the market, of course, but they may be screwing around still, uh, being 13 games under 500. They may be making some moves. Um, you know, you got to keep an eye on, on what they might do here today, too. So uh, I, would, I like Pablo here. Um, really no Cardinals for me. I don't really want to go out of my way and go after Pablo. If anybody would be like, oh, I don't know, um, maybe a Nolan Gorman uh, or something like that. Um, Lars, yeah, probably not at 4,200. He's in the three hole. It's okay as like a one-off piece um, in the outfield. I don't really want to play Brendan Donovan, you know, in this matchup or anything like that. And Goldschmidt and Arenado at their normal price tags in this matchup, no thank you. So uh, mostly just Pablo at pretty low ownership, I think, in um, in that matchup. Michaelis going for St. Louis. Now, this is one of the matchups for Michaelis in which he could pop, um, but he didn't strike out anybody. He's got a 16% strikeout rate this season. Uh, it's to both sides of the plate. Um, a little better against lefties, but like whatever. It's the line drive rate that always keeps me off of Michaelis. He doesn't throw it past anybody, and he gives up way too many line drives here with north of 30% aggregate hard contact. And I can't get excited about that. So uh, until he starts inducing a hell of a lot more ground balls than he is and getting back to the old Miles Michaelis, uh, I'm going to stay off of it. He's still efficient early in the count, doesn't walk anybody, and stays off of the barrel. So that does keep him serviceable. And in a very high upside strikeout matchup for him, right against the Twins here, 27.5%. This offense is just dreadful. They are so bad. Um, they can't make any consistent contact uh, and even their supposedly good hitters like Correa and, and Byron Buxton, they're both having really down seasons also. Um, so I'm not playing Carlos Correa at 4,700 unless I'm fully stacking the twins, which you can do. You can go after Michaelis, um, which I like to do, right? I'm, but you know, I'm not thrilled about playing uh, 4,700 Correa. I would, I'm going to continue to play Eddie Julien. He's at 3,300 still. Uh, so I've got no problems doing that. And Byron Buxton, under 5,000, 4,900. Uh, he is about an 060, 070 ground ball to fly ball hitter against right-handers with a big strikeout problem. That's not really a concern on either front here with a 15% K rate for Michael as two righties and a buck 15 ground ball to fly ball. Um, so I think that puts Buxton in play a little bit. So my favorite stack here would be a short twins play. I really hate full stacking the twins because they're garbage. So it would be like a 2-3-4 Julian Buxton Kepler right in the middle of the lineup. Uh, if you want to throw in a Correa and a Georgie Polanco, there's enough positional flexibility there that you can make that happen. Um, I don't really want to deal with anybody down at the bottom of the lineup. Maybe a Joey Gallo in a wraparound stack or something. Um 
since Michaelis isn't going to throw it past him necessarily. So that's okay, and that's going to pop the Twins in, in value here. You want to play some correlated teams? I think it's fine. It's not my favorite, certainly, but that doesn't really mean I want to go play Michaelis. I just um, I really don't respect any of the changes he's made in the last couple of seasons. Totally, it, totally gone with the ground balls um, where he used to be earlier in his career, and he's exchanged all of the ground balls for, for line drive, so really not interested there uh, without any whiffs. Uh, even though if you land on him, at 6,900, like, sure, fine. But I'm, I probably won't X him necessarily, but I'm not, uh, I'm really not confident with any more than about 5% of my teams here with Michaelis, um, just due to a real lack of upside. Um, even though this is one of the matchups against this particular offense that uh, he could pop. So that's kind of how I'd like to play it. Mostly the Twins here. I'm just going to stay off of the Cardinals uh, pretty much exclusively. Okay, let's move on to the White Sox in Texas. Jesse Schulten's on the mound. They've traded everybody, so they don't have anybody else. He's 5,600, but he gets Texas, uh, so no thank you. Uh, he's only got a 15% strikeout rate himself and a 10% walk rate to the left side of the plate. Short sample uh, on Schulten's. He's, most of his appearances this season have been out of the bullpen. 16 appearances and just two starts, and those were really just spot starts. Um, efficient early in the count, right? 68% strike one, that's, that's fine. And a 7.5% walk rate is fine, too, with a 6.5% barrel rate. That's pretty good. So that'll keep him serviceable, but this is Texas, and he's going to have trouble throwing it past them, and that's not a game you want to be playing against the Rangers. So unfortunately here with the uh, with Texas, I mean, it's just price tags as it, as it really has been all season. That's going to prevent you from getting to a lot of them. Send me in 6,000 again. Addy Garcia, 55. Everybody else is very attainable, however. So it's those two, unfortunately, that you, you know, almost always want to be playing in your stacks uh, that are going to make things hard to get to, you know, with um, some really equitable pitching. But you can make it happen. There's plenty of value to go around. Uh, I'd probably like to stay off of Jankowski in general, but this is an upside spot for him. He'll be in the two hole again, and he's 3,000, so go ahead. Uh, Nate Lowe, I think this is fine, but Addy Garcia, Josh Young, and like Mitch Garver, uh, really want to play all of those guys, but you could play literally every single one of them, including Leoti down at the bottom of the lineup uh, against Jesse Schultons. Um, and Texas averages like six and a half runs a game at home. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to try and get to as much of them as I can. Now, with Andrew Heaney at 6,600 on the mound for them, I think the ownership is too high here, as a matter of fact. I don't like the trending um, nature of his arsenal and the value in his arsenal. Uh, this slider has just been awful. It was fine earlier in the season, but it's been getting absolutely tattooed over the last probably eight, ten starts. Uh, he's just been totally dreadful. Um, you know, popped here in here or there for an okay outing, but one of them was against Cleveland, and he only managed 20 DK points. Another was against Houston, where he went five innings, struck out eight, kind of came out of nowhere. Um, in the last matchup, when he saw the White Sox earlier this season, he went five and two-thirds, struck out six, gave up two runs. You know, that was a 21-point outing, but he squeezed a win out of it. So really, it was just a kind of a serviceable outing at 17 DK points. So I think that's kind of where he's capped, and given where uh, the the changeup has been really all season, break even at best, same thing with the four-seamer, and the swing and miss with the slider uh, is totally gone um, you know, declining precipitously in value. Uh, I'm going to stay off of it I, and certainly come in underweight here. I do like the price tag, but they've, they're have they healthy now, healthier. Um, Yoan Moncada's back. Aloy is healthy for the time being. And these guys hit a lot of ground balls against right-handers. He gives up a 221 ISO with an 075 ground ball to fly ball. It's because of neutral changeup value. And he gives up two homers per to the right-handers. He's got a 10.5% barrel rate with a 10% walk rate. Now, I know there has been historically some strikeout upside, but it's not there anymore. He's just an average strikeout pitcher anymore, and 20% ownership. Um, that, that seems pretty dangerous here. There's a lot of ground ball and line drive type of hitters, notably Tim Anderson, Yoel Moncada from the right side, Eloy, Jake Berger, Andrew Vaughn even. Um this is a dangerous spot, so I think you can stack this game if you could make this happen. 
positional flexibility wise might be a little difficult to make happen, but um, I think there's viability here targeting some offense here uh, and staying off of a little bit of Andrew Heaney. Can you play him in tournaments because he's 6,600? Yeah, sure. He's got some strikeout upside. This is still a pretty poor offense in general, right? 100 WRC plus against lefties, 24% strikeout rate on the season, low walk rate, no power. So there's that. But again, there's still some pretty good hitters over here with some some ground ball and fly ball type leans or uh, line drive type of leans, I should say. Notably, Jake Berger, Aloy Jimenez, Tim Anderson. Um, so I think they're intriguing and they're very playable, really off the board stack because they're bad, right? Um, but I think that has to put them in play a little bit. Okay, let's move on to Cincy and the Cubs. Um, ben Lively, uh, I want him to be good, man, but I really like the six-pitch arsenal, but I don't like how it's up, down, up, down, up, down in value. Um, you know, break-even four-seamer, Break even for all intents and purposes. Change up, um, you know, pretty below average, trending to the downside, really. Same thing with the curveball. Good sinker, good cutter, good slider. So those are allowing him to survive. And it's efficiency early in the count, right? 61% strike one. Uh, just not a lot of chase here or raw swinging strikes. So that's even with the six pitch arsenal. That's what kind of takes him out of play for us a lot of the time. Um, I want to get to some Cubs here. Certainly, uh, mostly the lefties. He's really good against right-handers. That's the sinker and slider going to play. Um, with the four-seamer cutter, which isn't all that great, and the lack of a really good changeup, that leaves him a lot more susceptible to left-handers, where he's given up a full 2.1 homers per nine. 80% contact rate's pretty big in aggregate, and an 070 ground ball to fly ball with 35% hard contact to the lefties. That's two, uh, 252 ISO, and that's a big number when he's only striking out 19% of the guys. Much better against the right side, 25% K rate, 135 ISO, 27% hard contact. So we don't want to be dealing with that when he's inducing a buck 50 ground balls per fly ball to the righty. So it's lefties here mostly, and probably just short stacks. Um, when guys have a pretty pronounced platoon split like this, when they're good against the right side, bad against the lefties, or vice versa, I generally don't like full stacking against them because they still have enough to pick through um, a lineup that will generally kind of go balanced. And that's a little bit of the Cubs, right? They have righties they'll throw in there, like, say, a Suzuki, Dansby, Chris Morrell, um, etc. Uh, Nico Horner, of course. So I'd like to get to, like, a Talkman, Ian Happ, Cody Bellinger. Um, Jamer's not in the player pool because DK is just kind of sc screwing around. We can't just get updates. Uh, so we can't play him, who you'd kind of like to play. Uh, so it would be like a Talkman Hap, Cody Bellinger. Belly probably in the outfield instead of first base at 5,200. Uh, Talkman, though, at 32, it's a really decent play here. 35 for Ian Hap is okay. Um, so that's kind of how I'd like to approach it. Just some lefties here. really like uh, Mike Talkman here at 32. I think it's a pretty decent value play. So no Ben Lively for me, just some Cubs. Justin Steele at 9,100, kind of a fishy price tag in this particular matchup even though the Reds are just a break-even offense for all intents and purposes against lefties this year, 98 WRC plus with a 23.5% strikeout rate. Buck 60 ISO, it's continuing to tick up as Matt McClain, Ellie De La Cruz uh, are got, getting a little bit more comfortable, CES as well. Um, they can go very right-handed heavy here. And generally, against a lefty, that would take me off. However, against Justin Steele in particular, I don't really care all that much. Because he throws a cutter and induces a lot of rollover and soft ground ball type of contact against right-handers. In particular, buck 60 ground ball to fly ball, 22% soft contact with a 21% hard contact rate. So that's fantastic. He only gives up an 095 ISO, give or take, to the righties. Leaves it on the table a little bit in the strikeout stuff. So at 9,100, I think we're a little bit lacking right in the raw upside. Um, so that's kind of a question mark, of course, and it, it, he does still only have, for the most part, just two pitches with the cutter slider here. He does induce a good few ground balls, right, buck 60 in aggregate, and he does have some swing and miss to the lefties, but like I said, they're going to platoon very heavily here tonight. Um, so from a suppression standpoint, I think this is a good spot for Justin Steele 
However, he's got, you know, a 280-290 ERA with expected metrics pointing a good bit north of that. With just two pitches, I'm very wary about paying pri- high price tags for guys. Uh, in what I consider to be still pretty dangerous matchups, um, even though the downside of Ellie's platoon is the right side, he's still going to strike out a lot. He's still Ellie, and he still has a hell of a lot of upside. Nick Senzel, Matt McLean with uh, Johnny India on the shelf. Senzel probably be up at the top of the lineup. Same thing with Spencer Steer. These guys have good numbers against lefties, and CES, uh, Kevin Newman, Stuart Fairchild they just brought back up, uh, etc., etc. All decent numbers against lefties, so it's a kind of a fishy and difficult matchup for Steele. At 9,100, I think a lot of the upside is priced out um, for us in terms of you know value. It's kind of priced in um, you know at the price tag. You know, that said, I think he's okay if you land on maybe like a steal and a short three-man Cubs or something. I think that's an interesting construction because you can still go after the Reds here because he does still induce 22% soft contact and just 21% hard with the cutter here. So uh, it's okay. Uh, I'm not. I'm just kind of lukewarm on it, I think, at the moment. 10% ownership, I, I probably wouldn't come in over this necessarily. So that's why I don't think... Uh, we're getting a lot of value out of it, but uh, it, I think it's certainly in play. I'll probably just stay off of the Reds because the price tags are stupid high, and I don't like the Arsenal matchup here uh, for Justin Steele. I still re- really respect his arm. Okay, let's move on. Cleveland and Houston. Gavin Williams, no shot that we go after him against Houston uh, with Jose Altuve and Jordan Alvarez back. Now, I don't know what the hell Dusty is doing down here, putting Jordan in the five hole, but this is a, like, a total joke. This guy's a top three hitter in baseball, and you need to be getting him at bats in the first inning every single day. So putting him in the five hole, I don't care if you're trying to ease him back in or whatever. This is Jordan Alvarez. Um, so it's 6,200. That It's actually a non-negligible hit to him, even though it's still Jordan, and you, know, you could play him even if he's hitting in the nine hole, whatever. But he's in the five hole now, and he's on a home team. He may only get four at bats here, and that's a that's a significant downgrade. You need the upside to get a full five at bats when you're paying 6,200 for a guy in a 14 game slate. Uh, it's not nothing, and you need to kind of be aware of that. So I'm really not happy that Dusty is doing this. Hopefully, he will move him back up to the uh, the three hole, or put him in the damn two hole. He's a good enough hitter against both righties and lefties to have him in the two. Um, in any case, I'm not playing Gavin Williams at 6,700. He's not going to strike out a lot of guys over here. And with Altuve and, and Jordan back, um, you know, Jeremy Pena not even striking out a hell of a lot or as much, I guess, this season. Um, you know, this is a really difficult list to get through. Kyle Tucker, Alex Bregman don't strike out either. So um, Josie abreu has been much better over the last month or so, even though there's not a lot of upside still for him. He's been better. Um So I don't want to play any Gavin Williams, even at a semi-attractive price tag. He just doesn't have any raw upside here in this matchup. 11% walk rate. Not a lot of barrels, so we'd like to see that a little bit higher if we're just going to get jacked about, um, you know, stacking all of Houston at their price tags. I mean, Altuve at 57 with Tucker at 57 as well, and Jordan Alvarez, 62, Bregman's 53. I mean, these guys are hard to get to, even the quote, cheaper pieces down at the bottom of the lineup, like Chaz McCormick, who you'd really like to play. He's still 4,100 as well, and it'll be in, like, the seven hole. So that's kind of tough. Um, no Gavin Williams here for me. Houston is a, a really, really high upside stack, I think, with those two guys back in the lineup, Altuve and Jordan. Um, and they're going to be totally off the board. Nobody's going to be playing them because they'll just go play Atlanta. They'll go play Texas. Uh, instead, and, and of course, San Diego or, or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, they're going to be off the board, and that makes him a really intriguing tournament stack here because Gavin Williams is not going to throw a pass him necessarily. Just 20% aggregate strikeout rate for him uh, against really both sides of the plate this season. Um, giving up a little bit more power and pop to the lefties, but we got a short sample, so not a ton we can go over there. Um, but yeah, you can stack Houston. I got no problems there. Framber at 11-1, kind of a ridiculous price tag. This is an all-time price high for Framber. We, I don't think we've ever seen him this expensive, and that's going to just take me off. Um, this is the 
one of the worst strikeout matchups in baseball. Um, even though Framber, I, I do really respect him, of course, right? He's got two, three, four ticks above average in the raw strikeout department. Um, more so against lefties naturally, but he's still, you know, two ticks above average in the strikeouts against uh, right-handers too. Induces a hell of a lot of ground balls at two and a quarter per. Uh, the changeup value has been a little bit better recently. He was getting bludgeoned with this earlier in the year. We talked about that a lot. And that made him really susceptible against right-handers because he only throws a two-seamer. So with a two-seamer and a bad change, I mean, he was just like putting everything on a, on a silver platter. So um, that's been a little bit better recently, but he's 11-1, and it's going to make it pretty impossible to get to an expensive offense if you're playing Framber. Uh, I don't think the raw upside is there for him. To, like, it's a suppression matchup. Could he strike out six? Or even, you know, seven or eight in, in five or six. In, yeah, of course. Um, and be on the plus side of the variance. But I don't want to pay 11-1 for that necessarily. So I'm going to come in. I probably won't X him because, you know, you play dangerous games when you do that sort of thing with Framber. But, I mean, this is really hard to stomach, I think, um, given how many expensive offenses and expensive players we'd like to play today. They're all in really good spots. And that makes it very hard to want to target a very expensive arm on a 14-game slate. There's just more collective upside for an offense than there is for a pitcher. This is a cash game play. Um, and, but even in this particular matchup, it's not really a cash game. It's a cash game price tag, I should say. It's not really a cash game play um, in this matchup. So uh, that makes it really hard for me to get excited about Framber here tonight. Uh, I'll have a little bit, but it's not going to be a hell of a lot, I'll tell you that much. Um so no Cleveland, I'm not going to be dealing with that. It's not like I want to go after Framber. Um, you know, Josie, you could play him every day. He's really, really heating up. And even at 5,800, he's probably just about value there when he's seeing the baseball this well. Um, you want to play an Oscar Gonzalez at 2,400? I mean, okay. But uh, nobody else for me, you know, from Cleveland, but very little Framber. I just really hate the price tag. I'd l like to play some Houston if I could make it happen, though. Okay, Mets and Kansas City. Jose Quintana, he's one of these guys down in this range I think I want to try and get to today. Uh, 6,100, this price tag really jumps out at me. Now, the Royals might be doing some shenanigans in the trade deadline here too. Got to be careful of that. They've been very, very good over the last week. Um, they swept the Twins, I believe. Whoever they just played last. Uh, put up a, a lot of production. You know, Bobby Witt is just like turned it on uh, over the last series or so, uh, really seeing the baseball. Um, you know, they've got some guys from the right side of the plate here that could make it a little bit difficult on Quintana, but for the most part, he's always induced a lot of ground balls, stayed really down in the strike zone. Um, still kind of in wait and see mode a little bit, but I think at 6,100, this is going to kind of have to put him in play for me against the Royals. This offense is just terrible, man. Even though they create a little bit better against left-handers than they do against righties. 88 WRC plus here uh, against the lefties with 35% hard contact. Uh, they still strike out a little bit, and they're still a pretty low upside power offense. Um, so if you want to play, I think both sides could be in play here. Mostly I'm going to have to side with Quintana because I think he's a better arm than this offense. Um, but if you want to play Bobby Witt or Salvi, Freddie Fermin behind the plate, perhaps. Uh, Eddie Olivares, it's okay. They're they're very playable price tags. Mikel Garcia, you know, not a lot of upside from these guys to get you there on full 14-game slates. But um, I think they can be in play platoon-wise and go after a little bit of Quintana. But I'm going to side with him at 6,100. I think there's upside for him at this price for 20, 22 points. Um, and if that gets you an expensive offense and a more expensive arm, Strider, Pablo Lopez, something like that, uh, yeah, sign me up. I think that could be serviceable. No Zach Greinke, of course, um, against the Mets here. It, it, like, he's probably just going to give up his, his token three, four runs, go five innings, and frustrate the hell out of you. Uh, if you want to get to some of the Mets, who have also been a little bit better recently, sure, go ahead. Um, keep an eye out for them. They may be trading some pieces away. Obviously, they're they're starting the unload. So Tommy Pham has been rumored to be on the the – the market here, so keep an eye out for that. Some of these other guys they'll probably hang on to. They're not trading PD. They're not trading Frankie Lindor, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, he, Tommy Pham would probably be the only one. 
Um, so just keep an eye out for what they want to do uh, lineup wise. Um, do you want to play? I think Nimmo is okay here. 4,600. That's fine. Frankie Lindo at Lindor at 52. It's okay. Uh, PD at 48. I like that a decent bit. Um, you know, that they're still going to be able to lift the ball a little bit here against Granky, but once again, not my favorite stacking against him with a low upside offense. Generally, uh, he's super frustrating to go after with full stacks. So, um, it'd be short stacks, Nimmo, Lindor, Pete Alonzo. You want to throw in Frankie Alvarez or something. That's okay. He's kind of an expensive 4,200 catcher piece though. So, um, you know, a little bit of the Mets, maybe, maybe mostly Jose Quintana here. I don't really want to deal with a lot of the Royals, uh, but I think you kind of have to have exposure to some Bobby Witt now that he's seeing the baseball a little bit better. Okay, San Diego and Colorado. Um, now, Ryan Weathers hasn't been officially announced just yet, so we're not totally sure what they're going to do, but it's likely to be him uh, by most accounts all across the industry. Um, he's got some velocity, right? 95 in the tank, but you can't really play him, number one, because he's lefty of Coors Field, and they go super right-handed heavy. Uh, number two, he only goes about four, four and a third every start. That's where they cap him. Um, they don't let him go more than twice through uh, a lineup. So it caps his upside. So even at 5,000, you just can't really get there. Um, doesn't have a lot of raw swing and miss stuff either. So that's a problem. And he gives a pop. So they want to get him in, eat a couple innings, and then get him out. So you want to play some Rockies? Yeah, I think this is okay. They did trade TJ Krohn and Randall Grichik, two of their higher upside bats. Grichik has been fantastic against lefties this year. Um, they did activate Brandon Rogers, however, who is 2,600. I think he's very clearly the best value play of the day. He'll be at um, at second base, probably in the five hole tonight. Um, and he's got a lot of upside at that price tag. Uh, and you really only need 12, 15 points out of him. He doesn't have to pop for 30 necessarily. But this is a, a mid-4Ks type of hitter uh, coming off of shoulder surgery. Um, he's been hitting for a long, long time for Colorado and you know he's been out there taking BP with the team uh with the Rockies for going on two and a half months now so um he by most accounts feels great and they did just activate him yesterday so um sure go ahead mix him in and and play as much of him as you can uh it's pretty much a free price tag uh, getting a lefty at Coors Field with him um outside of that they don't hit for a lot of power Zeke Tovar of course we're gonna love to play him at 4,200, not so much over the wall power, but uh, more so, you know, gap to gap and uh, line drive type of power from Tovar. Jury Profar's got, you know, okay numbers average wise against lefties this season. You could play him uh, and you can mix in Elias Diaz or maybe like an Elleris Montero, um, something like that. So Rocky Stacks are in play, but uh, not certainly not my favorite. They're well down the list, I think, even though they're getting Ryan Weathers, who gives up pop at Coors Field, you know, so. Probably just short stacks here, one-off pieces, Tovar, Diaz, Brandon Rogers types, uh, something like that for me. Peter Lambert, no thanks, obviously. Um, gives up pop to mostly right-handers this season. Been a little bit better after he came back up, but uh, he's still pitching to way too much contact. Full 79% here, and that means, of course, that you could play everybody from San Diego. Um, literally does not matter. Even Trent Grisham, I will probably have to have some exposure to him because he's 3,300. And he's a fly ball hitter. Um, Lambert so far has induced a good few ground balls to the left side. And, of course, this is at Coors Field. So it's going to put even the awful Trent Grisham in play for me. Everybody else, yeah, sure. Uh, if you can make the price tags happen, go ahead. And you just got to balance ownership with everybody on San Diego. Uh, okay, Boston and Seattle. Let's move on. Um, Brian Bayo on the mound, 8,900. I think it's a little fishy price tag wise here. Uh, would like him a little bit cheaper. I need some more upside out of the strikeout stuff. Um, but I like the matchup definitely for suppression. He's got a lot of ground balls here in the tank at, at 2-0 per fly ball. And that's really attractive. Uh, even with 36% hard contact with a super low walk rate, we can stomach the hard contact. Um, it's just a lack of raw strikeout stuff. He, he's got a break-even arsenal for the most part. Wish he'd stop throwing so much of the slider because that's getting taken apart. Um, and it, I hope he stays... Wow, this slider is bad. I hope he stays off of this cutter. 
you know, but for the most part, he's been okay suppressing contact to right-handers and inducing ground balls, but he's been mostly attackable with the lefties with a 1.8 homers per nine. Lower ground ball to fly ball ratio, buck 50 there, so you can get to some, you know, 075 type of fly ball hitters from the left side. That'd be like a Cal Raleigh, for example, Mike Ford, um, Cade Marlowe. Um, but he's given up some pop there, right? 228 ISO, it's a pretty big number with just a 15% strikeout rate there. So some of the lefties here are going to have to be the favorites. If you want to mix in a righty or two, it'd have to be a heavy fly ball hitter, and that'd be like Tay Oscar or Julio. I mean, he has a lot of ground balls and strikes out, so probably not my favorite there at 51. Uh, Gino is okay, price adjusted at 33, but I kind of like Bayo here a little bit. It's mostly just the price tag that's going to keep me off. I don't like Seattle. I think they're a bad team. Um, somehow they're four games above 500 here. I don't know how the hell that's happened. But uh, I kind of like Bayo to survive here a little bit. Wouldn't be shocked if he survives for you know a good six innings here tonight uh, in Seattle and suppresses this pretty weak offense over here. Um, they're pretty bad. 102 WRC plus, 26% K rate, 230 batting average, and a you know 170 ISO. Fine, but. Uh, neutral ground ball to fly ball, they're average in most every metric here. We talk about this every day with Seattle. So Bayo, I think, could be in play. It's super low ownership as a, a punt, um, but it's not like a value target at 8,900 for sure. Uh, Bryce Miller on the mound, I don't want anything to do with this uh, for the Mariners. 9,200, I think he's too expensive, number one. Um, he does have some strikeout stuff, but he's got a huge, huge platoon split in terms of the raw swing and miss. 28% Ks to the righties. You know, good numbers here. 150 ISO, it's okay. 070 ground ball to fly ball, that's fine. Um, but the 37% hard contact to the right side, that's a big worry. It's mostly left-handers with the lack of swing and miss. 19% strikeout rate, 215 ISO allowed. Same 070 ground ball to fly ball with 40% hard contact. Uh, he is due to get absolutely blown apart and to give up about nine homers in an outing sometime pretty soon. Um, and I think I'd like to get to a little bit of sneaky Boston here. I'd like to really get to some Devers. I love 5,000 for him. This is fantastic. I think Yoshida is going to be in play. Not my favorite $4,800 outfielder necessarily in terms of raw upside, but the batted ball profile matches up here pretty well. Same thing with Jaron Duran. He's going to hit it in the in the air a little bit. And strike out maybe, um, just because he strikes out a lot. But this is a an upside spot for him to make some contact against Bryce Miller. So, um, you know, the walk rate is impeccable. The barrel rate is not impeccable at a full 11%. So I'd like to get to a little bit of Boston here if I can. Mostly some lefties uh, and right-handers that don't strike out. Duvall's going to strike out a little bit, so not my favorite there. So probably just like a short stack, Duran, Yoshida, Devers type. Um, Tristan Casas is okay at 3,200. You want to mix him in as well, but not my favorite batted ball profile since he's such a heavy fly ball hitter himself. So short stacks here uh, for Boston, I think. No Bryce Miller for me um, in this particular matchup. And maybe a little bit of Brian Bayo. I mean, I don't know. It's kind of a, a fishy price tag, like I mentioned, but I think he's kind of got to be in play. Okay, Arizona and San Francisco. Zach Gallen, 10-5. Well, he's, he and Pablo Lopez are certainly my favorites up above 10,000. That's where I'd like to get, um, and I'm going to try and build a couple of teams with those two in it, or in them, I should say. 10-5, uh, I think this is fine. Uh, I got no problems ever playing Zach Gallen. 15% ownership, I think, is fine. 10-5 um, is yeah, maybe a little bit expensive for him, but this game's in San Francisco. It's 60 degrees. I don't really care. Uh, they're going to strike out a lot still. 25% strikeout rate against righties this season. And the ISO has actually ticked down quite precipitously over the last little while, not hitting for near as much power as they were earlier in the year. 101 WRC+, plus, neutral ground ball to fly ball, above average hard contact rate, but nothing really to write home about necessarily. It's just 34%. 241 batting average, right? And they're going to walk, but Gallon's got... You know, really, really good control. 5% walk right here. So that's not a problem. I want to get to as much of him as I can. Um, I think taking stands up above 10,000 with some Zach Allen and trying to get a little bit of leverage on the field, I think that's an okay construction if you want to approach it that way tonight. Um, so give me Gallon. Give me very little, probably zero San Francisco. I don't know, maybe a Jock Peterson, 3,600. I like that. That's fine. Uh, outside of that, I don't really want anybody else. I really like Gallon. 
Uh, Alex Cobb, you know, we got to keep an eye on what the hell the Giants are going to do. They might scratch Cobb again and push him back. And I don't know. Kapler is frustrating um, that they can't just announce a starting pitcher and run with a guy all day. They got to scratch him three hours before lock. Anyway, um, Alex Cobb, I think, is OK, too. At 8,200, maybe a little fishy uh, for upside in this particular strikeout matchup because he's only got a 15% K rate against the left side. They're still going to have probably six, maybe even seven lefties in the lineup tonight. Arizona, they did trade one of their uh, cheap outfielders, um, you know, that they had recently in the five hole in Canzoni in order to acquire the closer from Seattle. Um, so that might make it a little bit difficult to get to some left handers here. They might have another righty in the lineup um, in that respect, but no matter, there's still good hitters over here that don't strike out a lot. Jerry Perdomo, uh, Ketel Marte, Corbin Carroll from the left side, McCarthy and Alec Thomas, you know, kinda, they're fishy. Um, but Christian Walker doesn't strike out. You know, Lourdes doesn't really strike out a lot. So it's still kind of a difficult matchup there. I generally don't want to stack against Alex Cobb, of course, because of the heavy ground balls. And certainly with, heavy, you know, 30% strikeouts to the right side. I don't want a single right-hander against him, no matter if they don't, if they strike out or not. Um, so I think at 8,200 in San Francisco as well, he's got to be in play at low ownership. Uh, I think he's got 25 in the tank here in this particular matchup. It's not thrilling. I hate going after Arizona, but I think Alex Cobb is a suppression wise, a well above average right-handed arm. And I generally like playing Arizona against average and below average right-handers. Um, Alex Cobb, definitely not one of those. So I think both pitchers are in play here. I'm going to stay off offense for the most part. I just don't like the, the weather here. I don't like the park, and I like the arms. Corbin Carroll, yeah, sure, but I'm going to stay off of pretty much everybody else outside of, like, late slate plays. So pitching only there for me. Okay, last game here, um, Oakland and the Dodgers. Ken Waldachuk is who I've got in the sheet. Uh, looks like it's going to be him. It uh, doesn't matter who it is. You're not playing in anybody from Oakland against the Dodgers. Um so stack the Dodgers if you can. If it weren't for San Diego, they'd be the top stack of the day in my estimation. Um, Mookie should be back. He's been dealing with, I believe, an ankle or something. He's down to 6,100. It's kind of a steel price tag in this particular matchup. Uh, Waldachuk just gives it up in spades to the right-handers. He's been a little bit better this season, but he's still giving up a full 200 ISO with a 12% walk rate and a 20% strikeout rate with neutral ground balls per fly ball uh, to the righties. So no thank you giving up a little bit more production to left-handers here, too. So if you're stacking the Dodgers, don't neglect, like, Max Muncy. Um, I mean, we've got some kind of shenanigans here. Um, like, I'm showing a different Max Muncy over here in, in, in my lineup builder. Um, so I'm not sure off the top of my head uh, what Muncy's price is for the Dodgers. Um and who knows? I mean, I haven't seen anything. They may have traded him. I, I don't even know. Uh, in any case, um, don't neglect the lefties like Freddie Freeman and Muncie uh, against Waldachuk. He'll still give it up there, too. So uh, Dodgers everywhere, if you can make it happen. Um, they've got some cheaper right-handed bats like Chris Taylor, Ahmed Rosario, Kike Hernandez back in the lineup, too. Um so they're stackable now. Not everybody. With J.D. Martinez probably still on the shelf a little bit with the hammy. Um you know, they're a little bit cheaper and more attainable, so that will boost their ownership, of course. But uh, overall, I think the Dodgers probably still, given all the other offenses, um, are probably still, you know, likely to be uh, very attainable ownership-wise. So uh, all of the Dodgers, if you can make it happen. Lance Lynn going for them. He's making his first start for L.A., 7,900. He's, he's 31% owned here so far. Uh, I think this is pretty fishy. It's a bit high. This is Oakland. Let's not get confused, okay? He's still going to strike guys out. That's fine. Um, and he's probably going to be pretty damn excited that he's playing for the Dodgers now and not the freaking White Sox. And in his first matchup, he gets Oakland. So, yeehaw. This is a good spot for him. 30% ownership, however, is pretty aggressive given his drastic platoon splits. He has been horrific against left-handed hitters this season. 
338 batting average, 435 WOBA, and a 298 ISO allowed. I don't care that there's 23% strikeouts there when you're giving up 38% hard contact and 080 ground balls per fly ball. Three homers per nine to the left side this season and 260 hitters. Like, this is not a small sample necessarily anymore. Um, that's a significant split, and it's some of the worst numbers in baseball, right up there with, like, Chris Bassett. Like, it's just absolutely terrible. So you can play some Oakland here, like a Seth Brown, notably 3,400, still dual eligible first in the outfield. That's fine. Cody Thomas, he's 23 in the outfield. You could do that. Tyler Soderstrom has dual eligibility first in the outfield. 2,900, that's fine too. Um, Not my favorite Tony Kemp play at 3,800, but it's playable. J.J. Blade in the outfield at 3,000 flat, also playable. Uh, Good late slate stack. Because Lance Lynn will be like 60-70% own on the late slate. And that's a hell of a lot of leverage. So given that, I think you know some of these Oakland bats here are in play. Um, if you want to fade them because they're going to strike out a lot, that's fine. But if you want to come in under on Lance Lynn, I'm also okay with that. I don't really want to get 60% of Lance Lynn or anything uh, super crazy here. I think it's a little bit fishy high. Now, I do recognize that the projection is 20 for a guy that's 8,000 here, and this value score is just off the charts at 46.5. So, yeah, you got to have exposure here because this is still Lance Lynn with a 30% K rate to right-handers, 27% in aggregate, um, and this is still Oakland. So you got to have exposure definitely and certainly in correlated teams, but you're not really going to be fooling anybody, so you're going to have to balance ownership if you choose to build this way. I think it's fine, but... Very, very dangerous given this platoon split. These are bad, bad numbers, and you can't ignore them. Uh, with a full 11% barrel rate, that's a you know a significant weakness. So uh, mostly the Dodgers here, and yeah, absolutely some Lance Lynn, but some Oakland is certainly in play as well. Uh, okay, let's go over a review real quick and then get out of here. Tampa and the Yankees, a little bit of Tampa here if you want to stack against Carlos Rodon. There are very playable price tags, or more playable price tags. Um, and I'm still in, in the wait-and-see mode with Rodone. He's walking too many people. No, thank you. Zach Eflin is fine at 10-3 in this particular matchup. There's still good strikeouts to be had over, over here against the Yankees. Jake Bowers and Aaron Judge, of course, the favorites from New York. Uh, Milwaukee and Washington. Uh, it's kind of a write-off game for me for the most part. Um, Freddie, definitely. Uh, like, you can play him. It, it's fine. It's a fine suppression matchup, but... Um, I don't really want to play Washington on a 14-game slate. Don't really want to play JoJo or any of Milwaukee because they're kind of expensive. And I really, for the most part, respect both of these arms to survive a little bit here. I'm just kind of, I'd rather play other guys, I think. Mostly a write-off for me. Detroit and Pittsburgh, no Matt Manning whatsoever. I think Pittsburgh full stacks are, are absolutely in play. Yohan Oviedo in play as well at 6,200. Um, I think he can make some really interesting constructions happen for you going after some Detroit. Um if you want to play a couple of Detroit left-handed pieces, Zach McKinstry, uh, Kerry Carpenter, notably, uh, that's fine. If you want to get to a Torque as well at 4,000, that's okay too. Um, don't really have a problem doing that, but I'd probably just side with Pittsburgh and Oviedo. Baltimore and Toronto, no Bradish for me here, uh, no Ryu either. Um, maybe a little bit of Toronto with like a, a Austin Hayes, a Santander, Mountcastle type of stack. I think that's very playable, but no Bradish. He's just too expensive for me. Uh, very little Toronto because uh, they're kind of expensive, and I kind of respect Bradish a little bit. Angels, Atlanta, um, Shohei, definitely, always. Uh, Strider, definitely, always. And some Atlanta, definitely, always. But, uh, you know... Everybody in this game that you want to play is, is stupid expensive. Uh, no Patty for me and no Angels outside of that. So if you can make everybody happen, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, one-offs are pretty much the best way to be playing Atlanta just because they're so expensive. Um, Minnesota-St. Louis. Minnesota's, yeah, in play. They've got to be against Michaelis. I, I really like stacking against him because he stinks in my estimation. Uh, Pablo Lopez, I, I really do like. I am not super thrilled about the price tag. Probably rather, if I had to choose, pivot it to Zach Gallen, uh, a little bit cheaper. But I, I really like um, you know, Pablo's plate discipline numbers. They're just excellent. And going after St. Louis, I've got no problem doing that. No cards for me here tonight. Um, and some Minnesota short stacks. I'm going to play Eddie Julian every single day until they raise his price. So I think a 2-3-4 stack there uh, with the Twins is very much in play. White Sox, Texas, um, no Schultons, of course, and very little Heaney for me. 
I know he's popping really hard so far in the projections, but I think some White Sox here are very much in play. Um, I don't like how Heaney's trending, and I think there's a hell of a lot of variance with him, and he could give up a seven spot in two and two-thirds here, and I would not bat an eye. Um, so I'm going to try and get to a little bit of the White Sox here. With a healthier lineup, they are far more dangerous against a guy that gives up pop to right-handers. Texas, yeah, absolutely. Um, they're a pretty damn good stack, as they really are always. Cincinnati and, and the Cubs, very little of the Reds for me here tonight. Uh, same thing with Ben Lively, just can't do it. Uh, Justin Steele, maybe. Yeah, he's okay at 9,100, I suppose, if you land on it. And I like short stacks of the Cubs here, too, uh, going after some Ben Lively. Lefties, mostly. Cleveland and Houston, no Cleveland for me, uh, outside of Jose Ramirez, uh, maybe an Oscar Gonzalez or something against Framber. Um, Framber at 11-1, though, I'm going to come in under... I'm not going to X him, but, like, 11 ones just way too expensive, I think, in general for this particular matchup. A lot of the upside just totally priced out for us. Uh, Houston, yeah, if you can make it happen against Gavin Williams, they're going to be totally off the board. Um, nobody's going to be playing them, and I don't think that really should be the case. Uh, Mets KC, Jose Quintana, I like at 6,100 a little bit here. No Granky, of course. Maybe some Mets with some PD at 48 again. Uh, I like that. And some Bobby Witt on the other side. Uh, outside of that, everybody from the Royals is just dreadful. San Diego, Colorado, offense only, of course. Um, like some Colorado pieces here, certainly some Brendan Rodgers, 2,600. And Zeke Tover, of course, when I play him every day. And obviously every single one of the Padres. Just got to balance ownership there. Uh, Boston, Seattle, a little bit of Brian Bayo maybe, and some Boston short stacks I like going against um, attacking some really bad numbers against lefties and a lot of fly balls and hard contact for Bryce Miller. So no Miller for me. I'm going to stay off of that pretty much exclusively. Probably stay off of a lot of Seattle, too. I don't like the offense. Uh, so maybe like a Teoscar, Mike Ford, um, or even a Cal Raleigh. But do you really want to chase a, a two-homer day with Cal Raleigh? Eh, not necessarily. Um, so mostly Boston here a little bit. It's pick em right now in the betting markets for the most part. So I think it's an all right punt to, to make with Boston tonight. Uh, Arizona and San Francisco, off, or, uh, pitching only for me, no offense in this late game here. Zach Allen, I, I really do like a 10-5. Alex Cobb, certainly in play two at 8,200. Um, question marks about upside against the left-handers, but uh, certainly price tag keeps him in play, uh, as does the ballpark. Um, so no offense outside of, you know, one-offs here or there with Corb Carroll and Jock Peterson, for example. Oakland and the Dodgers, some lefty Oakland pieces against Lance Lynn for leverage. Definitely on the late slate. I mean, absolutely on the late slate. Uh, Lance Lynn, for sure. Uh, but I think I might come in under this 30% ownership. It's a little fishy on the main slate, even though um, Oakland is dreadful. Dodgers, every single one of them, if you can make it happen. Okay, we are done here. Uh, went long again, but we got 14 games. Keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates as always. And good luck to everybody here on this big Tuesday.